Lord, I thank you that you are the one that gives us blessing. We welcome your presence this morning. We thank you for the time that we have to gather together to get in this place this morning. Lord, bless those who are at the beach. Lord, we thank you for those that are here. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come and praise, to worship, to declare our love and our allegiance to the one who knows us best and loves us most. So, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We welcome you. We come expecting to receive something new and something fresh from you this morning. We come with hearts available. We come, Lord, to be used of you, to bless another, to speak words of life and encouragement to one another, and thus to receive the same from you. So, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. And everybody who agreed said, Amen. Amen. Okay. As long as we're all standing, why don't you join us in worshiping our Lord and King? Amen.
one who stands above all others. He knows me by name. The angels hide their faces in his presence. The demons run for cover when It's amazing that the Savior and the Father, He is a friend to me. How can it be, oh, I'm not just open. Thank you, Lord, that you know us, you love us, and you never will, ever will fail us. Hallelujah, Lord. Last day. 
In my Father's house, there's a place for me. He who knows me best still made a place for me. Amen. Yeah. I'm a child of God. He who knows us best loves us most. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you our Christ. What beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name You didn't want us to be sad, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of
What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name. Powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Amen. Yes. Nothing can stand against it. It's done. It's finished. Yeah. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord has put it on Judy's heart to join the church. God adds to the church. I hear all kinds of stuff. Oh, you've got to get this campaign. You've got to get that campaign. You've got to you do it this way. You've got to get that program. No, I think if we just love people, then we'll let the Lord decide who shows up. And love them after they get here, too. And so we just thank the Lord that he's adding to the church daily. We thank him for Judy and what God is doing in Judy's life. She's decided that this is where God has called her to serve. This is where God has called her to grow. This is where God has called her to be used and to be blessed and be a blessing. Would you stretch out your hands? Father, we just thank you for Judy. We thank you for the gifts that you put inside of her. We thank you for the experience. We thank you for the Holy Spirit which guides her. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing and will do in and through her life. Lord, we welcome her in the name of Jesus. We welcome you. We count it a privilege that God has chosen us, allowed you to be here to help us grow, to encourage one another. And Lord, as we as participants, we as partners together in Christ, we welcome you. We welcome you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Blessings. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Okay. Before I came here, I was going through some really rough stuff, and God gave me the song, The Goodness of God, as his song to me. And I want you to know, when Andrea brought me the first day here, that song was played. So I knew that day, this was where God was leading. Amen. 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 Welcome. Again, I want to talk about the rest stop for just a minute because um, I forgot to say, you, all, you have a card. If you didn't get a card for the rest stop and the things that we, you can provide for the rest stop, we have some, and Rick has them, see Mary. Okay, if it's frozen, see, just see Mary. You know, see Mary. You know, it, it's one of those things. Uh, you, you, if you're busy, if you need something done, find somebody who's busy and getting stuff done. Amen? And that's the way it works. I want to take a... Last week, we looked at um, a little bit different look at revelations and how, you know, John wanted to give us a fresh glimpse of Jesus. You know, and John wanted to talk about, man, I've, I, I've known Jesus literally all his life. They're cousins. 
He's been closer to him than anybody else in ministry. He was part of the inner circle. John is the only one that went to the cross. John was entrusted, Jesus entrusted John with his mother Mary. John was discouraged, and, and, and so last week's sermon, you can pick it up. But again, I, as I'm reading the Word, I, I was thinking, I, I was reading something that you've, I've preached, and we've all listened to, and we've all preached. Well, if I don't know if we've all preached it. But it, it's the parable of the talents. It's found both in Matthew and in Luke. It's in Matthew, the 25th chapter, starting at verse 14. And, and it talks about the talents. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his servants and delivered his goods to them. It's another of the many parables that begins with the kingdom of heaven is like. And the thing is that if you look before this, you know, read what's on both sides of the chapter, read what's going on. Everybody knows the Bible was not written in chapter and verse. Luke did not get to, Matthew did not get to some point and go, okay, chapter 1, chapter 2. No, all of that was done by a French monk on the back of a mule going from Paris to Rome. And he broke it into chapters and verses, which we pretty much have accepted. Um, But Jesus has a lot of parables that begin the kingdom of heaven is like. And what he's talking about here is the fact that they're all saying, when are you going to come back? What's going to happen? What's going on? And he's saying, here's what you want to do. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to come back. But here's what I want you to do in the in-between time. The kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven, there's another phrase that Jesus uses quite a bit. The kingdom of heaven is among you now. It's already here, but it's not complete. Do you understand that? I had somebody one time come to me, and they brought me a book that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God mean two different things. And I tried so hard not to say, I hope you didn't buy this thing. (laughs) Because they're interactive, they're interchangeable. Kingdom of heaven is among you now. Again, Jesus is saying, what he's saying is, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants, his own servants, and delivered them, his goods to them. What Jesus is saying is, hey, do you want to know how to enjoy the benefits and the blessings of my kingdom here on earth? Here's how. This is the way. Now, we need to remember sets in Lieben. We need to remember the setting and time. We need to remember the culture. What are the hearers? What are the Jews that are listening to Jesus thinking when he hears him speak this parable? The rabbis, as well as Jesus at this time, taught that God's reign was both present and future. Jesus continually taught that the kingdom of heaven is among you, time and time again. This parable is literally about the practical day-to-day living. And these are the attitudes and actions you need in your everyday life to be fruitful, productive, blessed, and joy-filled. Because with the two of the three, he says, you've done well. Enter into the joy of your Lord. The reality, folks, is the joy of the Lord is not in the sweet By and by. It will happen. The joy of the Lord is ours to know and experience right now. The leading of the Lord is for ours to know and experience right now. The blessings of the Lord is for ours to know and experience right now. The healing of the Lord is for ours to know and experience right now. It's not sometime down the road. It's right now. The kingdom of God is among you now. parable is about the practical day-to-day living. And yet there are attitudes and actions we need to take in our everyday life if we want to be fruitful, productive, blessed, and joyful. It's available right now. Now, all too often, we see this parable, and most time we focus on the last guy, don't we? Most of the time, it's, it's sort of a, a hammer to hit you with that says, hey, you're not doing enough. You're not using your gift enough. You're not giving enough. You're not this. You're not that. And, we, and almost every time I hear this sermon preached, it's preached from the focal point of the third person, not the first two. 
It's preached from the third person who said, Whoa, you wicked and slothful, you sluggard. You buried the gift I gave you. And, and that's how we often look at this parable. And yet we need to understand the parable is saying that two out of the three are blessed. Two out of the three are joy-filled. Two out of the three are commended. Two out of the three are given more. Two out of the three are saying, enter into the joy of the Lord. We keep looking at this parable in the negative and yes, there, there's some accountability and responsibility that's, that's equated within this parable that we are to give an account for the gifts that God and the things that God has given us. But the reality, this is a parable. If you want to be blessed, here's how you live. These are the attitudes you've got to have in life. I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to shift some of our focus. Shift it to the kingdom of heaven is like here and now. The fact that God has given us talents and opportunities for growth, goodness, and greatness, that's a given. That's here and now. All too many are planning and waiting in the sweet by and by. No, I want to do what God's called me to do now. I want to know the satisfaction. I want to know that feeling of being right and doing right what he's called me to do now. I want that feeling when I've started a project in the name of Jesus, it gets finished right. See, the tragedy, all of us, too many, not all of us, too many are waiting for to do something, to do something, to do something. No, we need to be doing whatever we do now in the name of the Lord and do it right with the right attitude and the right character and God will give it the right outcome. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk, the word is also accomplish, them. So there are things for us to accomplish, we understand that. That goes well with this, with this verse. These two, the first two, they understood. We need to be doing something. We've been given authority. We've been given talents. We've been given to do things to increase our master's kingdom. They understood that. We, loved ones, have been given talent. We've been given the spirit of the living God to increase our master's kingdom. Okay, don't feel bad about the word master. He's our Savior. By the way, you will now know, if you are in the real estate market, that no houses have master, living, master bedrooms anymore. You will not find master bedrooms on details of a house. They're now the number one bedroom. We keep changing all our, all our words, so I need to keep you up with the correct things, so, yeah. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I've planned for you, says the Lord. I have plans to what? what? What are God's plans? I have plans to grind your nose in the dirt. I want to see you grovel. I want to see you whine and complain in pain. There's just something about you I don't like. No. But see, some of us feel that way. Some of us sometimes in our quiet time, we got that in the back of our mind. We're not doing enough. We're not good enough. God's not happy with us. God's disappointed. That's a lie from the enemy. We've all heard about the farmer. He plowed his fields. They were straight. He planted his fields. They were good. He watered his fields. He hoed his fields. I mean, he worked his little heart off. He was just a good guy. And one night, lightning hits his field. He jumps out of bed, slips on the rug, falls down, breaks his kneecap. He crawls to the stairs, misses the top steps, rolls all the way to the down to the bottom. He's able to crawl out the front door. He's trying to get a bucket to get water to put out the thing, and the handle on the bucket is broke. Finally, he just drops down in the middle of the field and he cries, Lord, Lord, why me? And a voice comes out and says, eh, just something I don't like about you. <laughs> See, the reality is, in the back of our minds, sometimes that's there. Devil is right there to tell us God's not satisfied with us. 
that we're not doing enough. The first two men in this parable, the first two servants, they understood their master's character. They understood what was required of them. The third person didn't. I know the plans I have planned for you, says the Lord. I have plans to prosper you. Can you say prosper you? Would you turn to somebody and say prosper you? Prosper you. That's God's plans. Poverty is not God's plan. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. I have plans to give you a future filled with hope and success. That's God's word for you. Turn to somebody and say, that's God's word for you. See, the tragedy is all too often we don't believe it. Well, it could be for somebody else. They do better. They think more. They're smarter. They're this. They're that. But not me, because some of us have grown up with negativity so enforced into our psyche. You're worthless. You're fat. You're stupid. You're adopted. You're no good. You're this. You're that. You're a waste of space and a waste of air. What happens is we're saved. We're redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're spirit-filled. But it's hard to get rid of those tapes. It's hard, especially when we're tired, when we know we haven't done what we should have done or been what we should have been. Those tapes start playing again, and we start agreeing with them. And I'm here to tell you that's the word of the enemy that comes against you. He who knows you best loves you most. When I got a hold of that, I just, it just, no matter what I've done, he still loves me most. He knows me best. He knows me better than my wife knows me. He knows me better than anybody, but he still loves me. And he still loves you unequivocally. In Deuteronomy, it says, I have plans to make you the head and not the tail. And the devil is right there to tell you, boy, you're nothing but the tail. You don't deserve anymore. You were born into the wrong family. You didn't finish. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. I'm here to tell you it's time we get rid of that stinking thinking and get the attitude that God has for us in our mind, the attitude that comes right out of his word. What is God saying about us? That he loves us, that we're precious, that we're the apple of his eye. I love that illustration. I love that concept. The apple of my eye. God says we're the apple. He protects us like the apple of his eye. He loves us. His plans are for good and not for evil, to make us the head and not the tail, that we should accomplish, prepared before time. Where are we at? See, the problem is we're believing the lie of the enemy. You're too old. You're not experienced. You don't have the talent. Yes, you do. You have everything you need in Jesus Christ. Loved ones, God has bestowed unto us, unto us his stewards, his authority with his presence, his power, his provision, his peace for being effective now. Would you say now? Now. Not in the sweet by and by. Now. Now it's when he wants it. Now this is a classic parable. It has a story form. It has intro, conflict, The conflict rises to a climax, and then it has resolution of the conflict, and then it has the practical everyday application is given to the listener, and the application which, if the listener will have ears to hear, will change and bless the hearers if they will put into operation what has been entrusted into their hearts. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus uses that phrase time and time again. Lord, help us to have ears to hear this morning. Help us to apply your word, your principles to our lives. The intro, 
It's a wealthy man leaving for a while to a far country. We don't know how long he's going to go. But he divides his wealth among his own stewards. God has given unto us gifts into his own, the family of God. We have the gifts that come from God. We are God's own. Amen? We have accepted him and we are loved in him by the beloved. He he entrusted his wealth among his own servants. A steward who is to use in his absence. Now, here's here's an interesting thing. When you read scripture, remember who wrote each book or who we believe wrote each book. We're not sure. But we do know that Matthew wrote Matthew. That's a pretty good clue. But what did Matthew do for a living? A tax collector. Was Matthew into finances? Okay. Do you understand that in every field, they have their own language? Do you understand that? Our our granddaughter, most of you understand, and I'm not bragging at all, graduated as an RN. And she's going to go on and become um, a baby uh, doctor's, a baby physician's assistant. And she uses jargon all the time. I'm going, whoa, 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 Victoria, this is your papa. Break it down into English. Well, it's simple. No, you've spent a quarter of a million dollars learning a language. That's $66,000 a year to go to PLU. So you pay to learn a language. Any other professions have a language? Luke uses that. God uses our personalities, doesn't he? How many times in Luke, well, if you, if you study, Luke will throw in a physician's language. He'll talk about, he'll use a medical term that illustrates the point. Peter uses nautical terms time and time again because he was a fisherman. So when Matthew, the, 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 the tax collector, knows the world of finance, and see, we, we got to understand, this is a time in the world they didn't have Wells Fargo Bank. They didn't have Chase. They didn't even have the Bank of Jerusalem. They didn't even have, when E.F. Hutton speaks, <laughs> mortgage houses. What they had were rather individuals who would either borrow or take your money and promise you a 1% or 2% interest back on your money. There weren't banks. So when the, when the Bible says he buried it, you should have put it in a bank, you should have given it to a person who guarantees you a couple of percent interest. But see, the reality is, Matthew uses, when the word, in the phrases, when he uses the word settled account, scenario login, that's only used once. That's a financial banking, financial term that only Matthew uses. When Luke talks about, you know, if you, if you see a brother and you're going to confront that brother in, in, in his point of that needs healing, point of sin, then you have to be willing. And Luke uses a medical term. You have to be the cast on the arm. You have to be willing to stand by that person, hold that person, help that person, heal that person, just as long as if it was a cast on an arm. So we can see how God uses these kind of phrases. Now, Matthew uses that settled accounts. It's the Holy Spirit that's working in each one of them. Remember again, in the intro, the, 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 the previous um, parable and the intro to the parables is about what are we going to do when you're gone? You're going to return. We understand that. But what's going to happen? And this is what Jesus is doing. He's saying, when I, when I return, 
this is what I expect you to be doing. This is what I want you to do in between time. So that's the intro. In the parable of the, of the, or the conflict, you're dealing with the gifts and the talents, the given authority, the opportunities given to the stewards by the man traveling to a far kingdom for them to use. He's not only given them the talents, finances, whatever. He's given them the authority. We have authority in the name of Jesus. Do we use it? I'm not just talking about blab it and grab it. I'm talking about living a life that resonates with the character of God. So that when we lay hold of something, we can be assured that God's behind it. The man traveling to a far kingdom, he's given them the talents to use, to invest, to look for opportunities, to advance their master's estate. All of this is with his authority. That's what Jesus has called us to do, to invest all the talents, all the gifting, all the opportunities that we have before us. Open our eyes to see the opportunities that are before us. Parable is dealing with responsibility. It's dealing with attitudes. It's talking about goodness, faithfulness, blessings, and the way of increase in our lives. And yes, it does deal with accountability and what's going to happen if we aren't accountable, if we aren't faithful. But that is not, in my opinion, the singular focus of this parable. It is part of the parable. I want to look at the part of the parable where two out of three increase. Where two out of three are commended and the Lord says to them, enter into the joy of the Lord. That's where I want to live. The parable is prefaced on the fact that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus says time and time, is among you now. So if we want to live in the kingdom of heaven, if we want to joy and experience the kingdom of heaven, now there are some attitudes that we need to develop so that we can be part of the first two. Amen? And I want to just look at them. Again, remember the sets in living, the setting in time, the original setting. The mindset for the Jews where they were God's chosen people. For an Orthodox Jew, and many now, the Psalms 24.1 is key to their life. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. For them, everything that happens good, every good thing that they eat, wear, ride, own, use as a gift from God. It's to be steward, it's to be administered, it's to be maintained, and it's to be multiplied. They understand that. That's part of the culture. It's called the theology of blessings. I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse you, those that curse you. God made it clear to Abraham that I will bless you. And there are the blessings of Abraham that pass on to us. The earth is the Lord's and all the fullness thereof. The theology of blessings. In the mindset of an Orthodox Jew, in the ones that were listening, the ones that were hearing Jesus speak, in their mindset. By the way, there wasn't any Gentiles. These were Jews he was addressing at this point of his ministry. They had a mindset. In the mindset of an Orthodox Jew, he or she will offer blessings to God every time something good or favorable happens in their lives. They lived lives with a constant reminder, a constant awareness of the recognition that God is active and in, in their affairs of all Psalms 24, 11. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he, the Lord, makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. For the Jewish culture, for the Jewish mindset of this time, they lived with a the theology of blessing. By the way, they knew what happened when they wandered away from God. They had a full understanding of what happened when they wandered away from God. Think Old Testament. 
Every time they wanted away from God, lifted his hand, and they got smacked. Now, the last time they worshipped, by the way, the last time they worshipped foreign idols was 596 B.C. when they got taken away to Babylon. That's the last time. They finally figured it out. And so when they came back under Nehemiah and under the others, idols weren't there. Now, they had other problems, but that was the last time they, they did deal, dealt with idols. So everything of good or favorable that happened to their lives, maybe it wouldn't be a good, it'd be a good idea if we would live with a constant awareness, a constant recognition that God is active in everything in our daily lives. Amen. I am with you. I will never, never forsake you. I will never, 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 never leave you, nor never, never forsake you. God is there all the time. And they lived with this concept of thanksgiving. They lived with this concept of theological blessings. If he's able to get a cab in a rush hour, he blesses Jehovah Jireh. He gets a business deal and goes well. Bless Jehovah Rohai. Any moment of any day, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the theology of blessings directs an Orthodox Jew's life. Might not be a bad idea if it directed our life too. Amen. Aware that God desires to bless. God desires to to make a way where there seemeth not a way. God desires to make us peace, even our enemies, to be at peace with Him as our ways please Him. Jesus loves me. God plans for me to... God, good plans. God has good plans for me to accomplish with Him and in Him. He has provided me with all the things to live for Him. He's provided guidance. He meets my every need. He delights in me giving me. He delights in giving me the desires of my heart. Boy, that's a strange one. God takes delight in giving us the desires of our heart. Amen. How many of you have ever gotten a present for somebody that you knew that you knew that you knew they really wanted? You thought about it. You saved up for it. You research for it, and you got it. I tell you what, I don't know, there, there's a lot more joy than getting something for somebody that they really, really want, but can't think they can get. God says he takes delight in giving us the desires of our heart. I'm the apple of his eye. He directs me with his hand upon me. He whispers me when I go astray. He loves me with an everlasting love. That's called a theology of blessings. Not a theology of cursings. In Matthew, Jesus blessed the loaves. Remember when Jesus takes the loaves and the fishes? And he blesses them. The earliest text says that Jesus blessed over the food. But a few of the translators have dropped the preposition over, not understanding that Jesus was not blessing the food, but he was giving thanks, blessing for the food. The Bible said, Blessed are you, O Lord, King of the universe, who brings forth bread, bread from the earth. King James Bible, by the way, translated, gives thanks. He was giving thanks for it. And there's also an asterisk right by it that explains it. The thing with most of us is uh, we bless the food to the nourishment and the strength of our bodies. To the Jew, they thank God for the food. And by the way, to the Jew, they thank God for the food before the meal and after the meal. Now, I've had some meals, none cooked by my wife, that I would have a hard time thanking God for them afterwards. I No, no, careful, careful. I said, none cooked by my wife. I was a bachelor for enough years, and I had no idea how to cook. 
If it wasn't for Jimmy Dean sausage coming out in 1968, I'd have starved to death. Jimmy Dean and, and eggs. I ate that a lot. I should have bought stock in Jimmy Dean. You know, I, I, uh, I mean, when you're 14 and 15, you haven't had a lot. And you know what else came out that really saved my bacon? Bacon. <laughs> saved me was those, those, Swansett, those Swansett dinners. You know? I could, I could eat two out of three that I made. And I could cook popcorn. I'm still one of the connoisseurs of popcorn cooking. I'm not bragging here. I'm just telling you the facts. Yeah. Jesus blessed. I, I think it's, we need to understand that, Father, thank you. Thank you. We need to be aware of his presence. Amen? Be aware that he's part of our life that he's watching over us, that his desire is for our best. His plan is for our best. As our best seeks to grow and increase his kingdom. Honor the Lord with your first fruits, the Torah says, possessions. Honor the Lord with thy substance, thy gifts. Honor the Lord with blessings. How many times do we just bless the Lord? We sing the song, bless the Lord, O my soul. But how many times do we just, during the day, Lord, I just bless you. I thank you. I bless you for the life. The Bible says that he gives us the air that we breathe. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this beautiful day. One of the great things to, is to be around people who are positive. They, they notice good stuff. I love to be around people like that. My Aunt Thelma and Uncle Phil were like that. They, 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 would, they could find something positive. And they would speak it out. And they would give glory to God. Gary Gray is another one who's, who always seems to find something positive. It's always a joy to talk to him in the morning. Because it can be pouring buckets. And they'll say, boy, we needed this rain. I'm so glad for it. This morning at sunshine. Oh, what a beauty, beautiful day, the sunshine. <laughs> Lord, help me have that kind of an attitude. Help me to give you thanks in all things. Okay, now I'm going to start the sermon. Three attitudes to living in blessings. One, lose the attitude of fear. I want to start with the servant who didn't know his master. Now, we have no indication that what the servant said was true. There's no indication of that whatsoever. In fact, just the opposite is portrayed in the parable. The servant had the wrong concept, the wrong character of his master. Well, you were this and you were that. A lot of us have a wrong concept of God. All too many believers listen to the voice of the enemy of our soul telling us that God is mad at us or God is at least disappointed in us. Often it makes us feel that God is looking for an opportunity to punish us. I want to tell you God is looking for opportunities to bless us. He's not looking for opportunities to punish us. He has paid the price for our sins already. We do not pay them again. He's looking for an opportunity to bless. I want to say to some who live in a low-level, constant state of fear, rejection, you fear that you're not adequate, you feel you haven't done enough, I want to tell you that's a lie of the enemy. That's a lie of the enemy, and you need to denounce it from your life right now. Because if you don't think you're righteous enough, I'm here to tell you that you will never be righteous enough. Because none of us are righteous outside of Jesus Christ. It's his righteousness in us. Amen? 
2 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and boldness and of love and of a sound mind. God is not some miserly uncle that you've got to re- wrestle the nickel out of his grubby hand if you want something. He's given us over 8,000 promises to bless, to reassure, and to promise to prosper us. His word will not return void, but will accomplish its purpose. We, as if, if, if you're one of those people, and I think we all have a tendency at one time, I'm not going to say speak for everybody, but there's a tendency at one time or another just to feel God's disappointed in me. I want to tell you, He loves you. He loves you. And if that disappointment is to keep you home, if that disappointment drives you to do nothing, if that disappointment drives you into a closet, if that disappointment drives you to, to fail to meet with the other believers and to function as God has called you to function, then you need to break that off, shake that off. I often use the, pair, the, the talk about Paul lands on the island at Malta. He's building the fire. The viper strikes him. We all have those times where something strikes us. What's Paul do? He looks at it and he goes, oh, how cute. Let me put something on it. Let me excuse it. Let me dress it up. Oh, it's my viper. It, I, 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 it's just my only viper. No, Paul shakes it off. We need to shake off anything that diminishes us in the presence of Christ. We need to recognize where Satan tries to diminish us, diminish our attitude, diminish our worth. He who knows us best loves us most. He knows your warts and cellulite. I'll I'll have somebody look up the word for you. God is not miserly. His word will not return void, but will accomplish his purpose. This series of parables are dealing with Jesus going away and returning, but they're intended to instill comfort, to set the course, to communicate blessings and assurance of his return and his presence. The kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, while he's away. We need not fear his return. God loves us. God loves me and God loves you. Amen? Turn to somebody and say, God loves me. God loves me. Now turn to somebody and say, God loves you. I don't know why, but no, no, I'm sorry. (laughs) God loves me and he loves you and we need to never, ever forget that because that's imperative for our walk. How blessed are those who observe his rules and seek him with all of their hearts. Friends, God loves us. His desire is to bless the faithful. Those whose lives according are living according to his character and his calling. It's time to lose the attitude of fear, dread, and neglect. Time to drop the concept that we're not good enough. It's time to replace it with the fact that God's love and desire is that we succeed and not fail. I have made you the head and not the tail. I've made you for success and not a failure. And any time somebody says you're a failure, you turn around and say, that's not true because that's not the Word of God. We need to remember that God is our source for everything that we lead, need in life and godliness. It's not our friends, it's not our family, and it's definitely not the government. Philippians 4.19, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Yes, the parable does convey the concept of responsibility and accountability for what God has entrusted us with. But it's not in a fearful way. It's not in a negative way. But it's in a fruitful way. A way of hope and joy. Enter to the joy of the Lord. I gave you five, you made ten. I gave you two and you made four. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I gave you everything you need for life and godliness. My plan for you, Ephesians, my plan for you is for good. Ephesians says, God, is before we were born, before we were a twinkle in our daddy's eye, that God had plans for us to accomplish for him. And anything that comes against that, we need to reject 
in Jesus' name. Amen? So the first thing we need to get rid of is that attitude of fear. We need to lose that attitude of not being enough. Second thing we need to do is we need to uh, live with an attitude of expectant blessing. Again, I talked about the fact for the hearer, the listener, the Jew, this parable places a great sense of opportunity, hope, and authority to accomplish and do the great things. Remember that, those words, theology of blessings. That's what the Jewish culture lived by. He loves us. We are chosen. We're blessed. We're special. Amen? To this day, if you run into many, many Jews, they're going to have that same attitude. And by the way, well, they should. Because they are. But here's the reality. Every one of us should have the same attitude also. I am blessed. I am special. He who knows me best loves me most. Living with an attitude of expectant blessings. Theology of blessing. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you all the family of the earth shall be blessed. For the hearer, that was the Jewish person at that time, their mindset was already a theology of blessing. Yet they understood in that there was a responsibility and accountability on each individual over every one of their lives. Everything they had was on loan from God, including life and breath itself. There was to be steward under and with authority. It came with blessings and joys. It came with endless possibilities. Romans 2.10 By glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works that what is good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. I believe it's time we all grasp the concept of the blessings from the hand of God. He's given us something that needs to be cared for. He's invested into us his own life. He's given us blessings for his kingdom. Or do we think it's our stuff? We worked for it. It's our lives. It's our money. And sometimes we begrudgingly give back 10%. And when we have extra time, when we have nothing else to do, we may serve him in some way. I'd like to look at a common... Uh, understanding of, uh, that I believe is a, is a common attitude of a lot of believers towards God and the blessings He has in our life. Ethan, let's show that. Let's turn off the house lights and let's turn up the sound and let's not do it too quickly because I want you to see it and hear it. Let's turn off the house lights because I want you to see Jimmy Stewart. Lord, we cleared this land we plowed it, sowed it, and harvested. We cooked the harvest. It wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be eating it if we hadn't done it all ourselves. We worked dog bone hard for every crumb and morsel, but we thank you just the same anyway, Lord, for this food we're about to eat. Amen. <laughs> Typical response to God. I did it. I earned it, I made it, thanks anyway. Every good thing, every good gift comes from God. We need to live with an expectancy of blessings. We need to live with an attitude, thank you, Lord. The parable is a call of awareness to living in the possibilities of blessing, of God continually for this is what the kingdom of God is like, kingdom of heaven is like. Remember, two-thirds of the participants in this parable are praised. They double according to their abilities with an understanding of blessing and authority over what they've been given. They saw and used what they were given as an opportunity for increase, opportunity for their master's authority, with their master's authority to increase the master's holding. And they also, in the meantime, got their own reward. That's how our lives are to be lived. Loved ones, the opportunity, the availability for increase, for blessing, for God's favor is continually before us. 
We need to be living with an attitude of expectant blessings. Amen? We need to be saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Attitudes are ones of expecting mind blessings are mindful of his authority, his presence, his power, his plans, his peace, as we continually submit to his lordship and his love. The third and the last, we need to embrace the attitude of stewardship. Embrace the idea that it's not ours. It's not ours. God's given it us to use for his kingdom. That's the big thing with this parable. It wasn't theirs. It was the master's. God's given us the talent. God's given us the time. God's given us the opportunity. God's given us the eyes to see. It's God who heals, not you and me. We need to understand that. We need to go to this revival. He can heal you. He can't heal anybody. She can't heal anybody. Only Christ can heal. We go running off with, oh, boy, this person. No, no, no. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's Christ who does the healing. I am his steward. I am the bride of Christ. I'm sealed by his blood. I'm filled with his Holy Spirit. I'm living under his authority, with his authority, with his ability, love flowing through me. I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen? And we all know Wayne Gwillem's definition of more than a conqueror. Wayne was Australia's heavyweight boxer. One of the toughest matches, a heavyweight match in Australia. One of the toughest matches he ever had. Guy broke his nose. Broke two of his ribs. He was battered to where he could hardly stand at the end of the fight. But he was the conqueror. He won the battle. Nose broke, teeth loose, hurting in every direction, two ribs broken. You know how he tells the story? He says, but I wasn't more than a conqueror. He said, my wife went to the pay window and picked up my paycheck. She was more than a conqueror. She didn't have to get into the ring. She didn't have to take any hits, but she got all the benefits. We didn't have to go to the cross. We didn't have to be scourged. We, who deserved it, did not have to endure it. That's why we're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pick up the blessings that he's already paid for. We pick up the benefits, the blessings, the purse, the privileges. Ephesians uses the phrase, we are stewards of the richness of God. Also talks about declaring that we're God's ambassadors, administrating his rule and his reign here now on this earth in his authority. We preached a number of times, or I preached a number of times, on the word eperonios. And it's the Greek word that's used in the first couple chapters of Ephesians over and over, saying that you and I are God's authority and that we can direct God's power and that we are here, put here by God to be under His direction, under His authority, to have authority and take authority. It brings huge, fresh understanding to the book of Ephesians at least in the first few chapters. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere by himself. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every, not one, not two, but every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, Eperonios, in Christ. All the sources and resources of the universe. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. We have been created predestined to
to accomplish good works. To each is given a measure of faith. To each is given gifts for the church, for the increase and the benefit of all. We need to be living with an attitude, loved ones. An attitude, I want to be a good steward of all that God has given unto me. Amen? It's not my talent. It's not my gift. It's God's. But I'm going to use it to His glory. I'm going to use the opportunities that I have to speak to people. I'm going to use it when He nudges me and say, I want you to talk to that person. Just bless that person right there. I want to be able to do that because that's a good steward. Giving account for His ability. God never gives us more than we can handle through Him, both negatively and positively. God talks about that, that he is going to bless us and use us. We need to have a relationship with God. We need to have a good character. Our living in the ways of the Lord, allowing him to direct our path. We need to be faithful in the things of the Lord. You realize the Lord doesn't say, he doesn't, he doesn't reward fruitfulness, he rewards faithfulness. I want to be faithful with what he's given me. I want to be faithful. It may not be a whole lot, but I want to be faithful to use what he's given me to his glory. Matthew 25 says, The Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. In life, there's a principle of increase or apathy. Any of you uh, pull any hamstrings? You know what that feels like? Running to first base. Snaps. And you feel it. You just feel it roll right back up your leg. Just rolls right back up your leg. Got a little bundle right here. Now, if you're a pro athlete, college athlete, you go to the hospital, they open you up, and they stretch you back down. If you're an old fat preacher... You just don't do anything, and after a few months, it dissolves, and you just don't have that one. When I pulled and I, and I stripped all the muscles out of this arm to where my bicep was under here, I just snapped. You could feel it snap. Just, everything just snapped, and my bicep just completely rolled around until it was underneath my arm. And I tried working for a couple of days, and, and I went to the doctor, and he says, well, if you'd been in here a day later, your arm would have been useless the rest of your life. That afternoon, they put me in. They opened up my arm from here to here. They rolled it around. I couldn't pick up a coffee cup for six weeks. I couldn't do anything for six months. Because if you don't use it, you lose it. It dwindles. We're stewards. We need to be using what God has given us, using our time, our finances, our circle of influence, our aegis of influence for God's glory, and he will increase it now. If anyone serve me, him my Father will honor. Use of what we have causes blessing and increase and favor to come upon us. Be bold, be strong, for the Lord thy God is with thee. There's a saying that says nothing ventured, nothing gained. I'm also here to tell you that nothing ventured means that it's going to roll up and the desire will dry up. In the context of God directing our lives, nothing ventured often means the desire is lost to do things for God. Start with what you have, one talent. People often, too often, bury that one talent. Complaining they aren't multi-talented. Do you know how Billy Graham began his preaching? He preached to trees. He went out and preached to trees. I thought that was a pretty good idea. So in my first church, we had cows. We, I was a gentleman farmer. We had 20 acres of olives. I soon learned I am not a gentleman farmer. We moved into town like I should have done in the first place. But I would go out on Saturdays and I would preach to the cows. I don't know if their milk was curdled on Sunday or not, but, you know, they, they uh, use what you have and God will increase it. Loved ones, according to God, according to his word, gives increase 
according to our release. God gives increase according to our release. If one doesn't speak to anyone, if one doesn't attend church, if one doesn't tithe or give offerings, if one doesn't use their talent to teach, to play, to witness, of course nothing's going to happen. In fact, even the desire to do anything for God begins to wither. I want my life to increase. So one, I need to lose the attitude of fear. I need to denounce the spirit of fear. I need to confess Satan has tricked me and ruled me with a wrong understanding of the character of God. He loves me. And he's not looking for an opportunity to smack me on the head. I need to begin living with an attitude of expectant blessing, the theology of blessings. A life of thankfulness, expectancy. I need to be that person that says, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I need to learn to begin to thank God for the small things and not just expect them, not overlook them. I got a parking spot. Thank you, Lord. Where did we park the other day? Went into a big parking lot and I just put right there in front. Wow, what a great spot. Since I was working on the sermon, thank you, Lord, for this spot. Now, if God really loved me, he'd have made me park way out because I probably need the steps. But we won't go there. I need to embrace an attitude of living as a steward, understanding that all things are of God. I'm going to be a steward that which God has already given me. I'll be using my time, his time, opening my eyes to the opportunities to witness that he gives me. I'll dedicate my finances that he's given me to be administered according to his principles and commands. I'll be refining the talents he's given me to plant seeds of promise and increase. The kingdom of heaven is like. That's what this parable is about. You take the talent and you take the authority and you use it in his name. You understand he is here to bless. It's his desire. It's his delight to give us the blessings of our heart. If anyone serves me, my father will honor. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen? How many of us need an attitude adjustment? How many of us have areas in our life where we're just, well, that's the way it is. I'm here to tell you that I believe we need to look at the kingdom of God a little bit different than we do before. I think we need to quit waiting for the sweet by and by and begin to live in the joy and the fullness of what God has for us right now. Yeah. Begin to live and begin to appreciate, begin to live with expectancy and begin to live with the, with the attitude of a servant. It's God, but he's given it unto me and he wants me to use it to bless his kingdom. He wants to use it me in any way that he can to further his kingdom. He wants and has given me this because he says his plans for me are for good and not evil, to make me the head and not the tail. Amen? Amen. Some of us need to say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for believing that lie that I can do it my way. That I can just live any old way I want and come running to you and expect to be blessed whenever I'm doing it my way. You want to be blessed, you do it God's way. Those that honor me, those those that serve me, my Father will honor. Amen? There is no condemnation whatsoever in this sermon. There is only the fact that God wants to bless us. He wants to encourage us. He wants to enrich us. He wants to give us more gifts than we've ever thought imaginable. Amen? Amen. I want to encourage you in that. I want to encourage you in that in Jesus' name. Carl, would you come? I'm sorry. We're going to be a record again today. Because after Carl teaches on communion, then we have water baptism. Then after water bat, okay, that's it. <laughs> um, is this mic on? Okay. Ooh. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, well. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Um, 
Before we come up for the elements, I just wanted to give a little bit of context to the celebration and something that's been very meaningful to me and helped me appreciate this a little bit more. Um, and most of this is coming from John's Gospel and, the, and his depiction of the Passover meal. Um, we know the whole story because we have the book, <laughs> and so we know how it ends, and we understand that Jesus was turning this meal into something different. But the disciples didn't. They had an expectation when they gathered in the room that night, and an expectation that had gone back in the Jewish community for thousands of years. If anybody's ever attended the Seder dinner or the one we had here the, a couple weeks ago, you recognize the Seder dinner, the Passover meal, is very formatted. It, it's done the same way every single time, celebrating very specific things, but there's a pattern to that meal that has to be followed, has been followed in Jewish tradition for thousands of years. And all the disciples in that room would have been going there expecting that they had attended Passover every year all their lives. They knew exactly how that meal was to be performed, and they went in with those expectations. Um, I would compare the Seder meal a little bit to a Lutheran church service. There's a very specific order of worship. And if the pastor ever deviates from that order of worship, the congregation is perplexed at best. Eh, some are a little angry, but it's definitely untoward. In this particular Seder meal, Jesus was that pastor from the very outset. In John's gospel, we see him washing the um, disciples' feet. That flipped the script right there. And from that point forward, the disciples would have been completely perplexed, totally confused. What is Jesus doing? This is not the Seder they expected. We don't get the whole conversation that John had, or that Jesus had, and the disciples had over that meal, but John does provide portions of that conversation. And in John 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus said, I, I think John included this because this was the pivotal moment of that conversation. Um, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now this scripture right here is an analogy, or it harkens back to, or it changes the narrative for the disciples, much the same way that if I were to say, we're fourth and goal with three, down by three. 200 years ago, that sense is complete gibberish. But today, 21st, Amer 21st century America, most people recognize I'm referencing football. In the same way, when the disciples heard those words, they would have recognized that Jesus was talking about a wedding. But to know how I get there, you need to understand a little bit about the Jewish wedding tradition in first century Galilee. So I'll real quick try to share that with you. Um, in first century Galilee, the, Jew, the Jewish wedding tradition had three steps. In the first step, first phase, the, two father, the, father of the, the fathers of the bride and groom would meet, and they'd come to an agreement of that this was a good couple, they'd agree on a dowry price, and basically get everything set up to move forward. The second step would happen very shortly thereafter. The two families would gather for a feast, and not just any feast, this was a seven-day feast. So it gave the families of the bride and groom an opportunity to get to know each other, plan for the wedding, basically get everything set up and celebrate this coming union. On the seventh day of the feast, the groom would give a toast to that union, and it would be a cup of wine. And I want to say, too, that everything up to this point had been between the fathers, the groom had some input, but the bride in Galilee actually had a little bit of say in the proceedings as well, and that did occur on that seventh day. When the groom gave the toast, if the bride, for some reason, didn't want to go through with it, if she did not drink from the cup, the wedding was off. Um, I don't know if this traveled throughout all of Jerusalem or all of Israel, but it was definitely a, a part of the Galilee tradition. If the, once the bride did drink from the cup, then immediately after that feast, the groom would leave, go back to his father's house, think of it like a compound. It would have been in the family for generations, many, many rooms. He would have a space within that compound. He would begin work on 
the home for him and his bride, this new home. However long it takes to construct, you get it done. Once he felt it was complete, then the dad and the local rabbi would come and inspect the premises. The rabbi was there to make sure that the home that was constructed was going to be better than, or at least comparable, but preferably better than the home the bride was leaving. If it wasn't, if it was lesser than what she had, the son had more work to do. Um, and this whole time that the son is building the home, the bride isn't just twiddling her thumbs. She's getting ready for her new life, get, doing all the preparations necessary, and remaining faithful to the groom through this whole process. I mean, it could be six months, tw 12 months, who knows how long it takes to make something that's better than where she is currently. She is totally committed to, this, to the groom from the point of sipping that cup up until he comes to gather her. Um, interesting that adds a, another layer of context to the um, story in Luke 1 and 2 about M Jerry and, uh, Mary and Joseph. But anyway, um, in the third phase, so he goes home, he makes the, and then the third phase is once the home is complete and the rabbi signs off on it, he comes back and he gra he, to gather his bride, the father sends him off and says, okay, go get your bride. He goes and gets her, brings her back, and there's another seven-day feast, and that's a wedding celebration for the entire community. Everyone gathers to celebrate that union, and then it's ended on the seventh day with the uh, um, consummation of the marriage and the hoopah. So that's what all the disciples knew from all the weddings they had attended in their community. So when Jesus says that, when he talks that I'm leaving to go prepare a place for you, and when it's done, I'm gonna come and bring you back to me, they would have understood right at that moment, this is no longer a celebration about a rescue from Israel. This is now a celebration of uh, coming marriage. And when Jesus blesses the cup and gives it to them and says, do this in remembrance of me, they would have understood that it's more than just drinking from the cup, but it's actually a commitment to engage in an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And that when he leaves, they are going to be faithful to him and prepare themselves for him to return and bring them back to their new home and their new life. So in that context, when you come forward to receive the bread and the wine. Understand that we're not celebrating, we, well, we're celebrating an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. We're agreeing to remain in fidelity and to prepare ourselves for him to come gather us and bring us home to our new home. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name.
Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And in that vein, Jesus, I accept your offer of eternal, eternal relationship with you. And I remain faithful forever. Amen. Amen. Excellent. I want to apologize for you for not giving you more time. No I, 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 I apologize. I should have cut that sermon into two. <laughs> but, uh, but I didn't, so now you get another short one next week. But remember, short is a relative term. Okay, right now we're going to have baptismal, and uh, we are excited about that because repent and be baptized. And it's just not motions. It's just not something you go through. I believe with all my heart that God intends baptism to be a very special time. I believe it's not only a time of saying, yes, I'm going to uh, follow the Lord. I'm going to do this in obedience. But God never calls us to jump through hoops. God never says, hey, I want you to jump through this hoop, jump through that. No, for everything that God tells us to do, there is a reward and a blessing. Amen. And the same with baptism. And so um, I want to say that in baptism, one of the things it says in 2 Corinthians is, is that it's like, Peeling back, we, we've lived our life with all this crud and all this input. And, and it says it's like, in baptism, it's like circumcision of the mind. You're going to peel back all that crud so you can hear and you can receive better the things of God. It's to be a time of, of renewing and refreshing. A time of, of not just dying, going down into the water and leaving that old person, but a, a new refreshing opening of the things of God to you. Amen? Amen. Amen. And come. Judy, you want to be first since ladies are first. Oops, probably shot. Patty, you want to? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go. Yeah. Has anybody heard Robert Morris tell that story about baptism? He was in a church one time, and uh, the church, like most churches, a lot of not most, a lot of churches have baptismals, and then they bring the curtain back, and it's a baptismal, and usually you can't see, you know, you see from here down. Well, this church had made plexiglass the whole front, and it was a huge baptismal. And the ladies were to come in from one side, and the guys were to come in from the other side. And so, and then it was sort of a, let's move them on through, you know. Well, the guy got turned around, and he went out the ladies' side, and they said, no, 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 you've got to go out the guys' side again. There's ladies in here. And so he gets around, and he goes, oh, man, the people, and the pastor's baptizing. So he jumps, he, he dives behind the pastor, and he's swimming. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he looks over, and he realizes, it's plexiglass. They're all watching me swim. <laughs> But you ought to hear Robert Morris tell the story. <laughs> anyway, Judy, what's your full name? Judith Lynn Goebel. Judith Lynn Goebel. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Oh, yes. Are you going to live all your days of your life for Jesus Christ? Yes. Used of him? Yes. And for him? And for him. Okay. Amen. Cross it up. Cross it up. Better hold your nose, though, Patty. Right. Got your watch on? Take your watch off. I'm not buying you another one of those. 
Judy, Lynn, Goble. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes. <laughs> Now, you stay right there a minute. Wait, wait until she comes up. I want you to stretch out your hands. Lord, we thank you for this sister. And we thank you, Lord, that there is a fresh anointing coming this morning. We thank you, Lord, that your blessings. We are praying as a congregation. We are praying together in the name of Jesus. We're declaring together in the name of Jesus that this is a day of blessing and fresh anointing. This is a day of renewing the gifts, reestablishing your kingship and lordship. Lord, release afresh and anew your Holy Spirit to our sister, we pray. And everybody in agreement said, Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and shake on Ed. <laughs> Randy? Oh, here, Judy. <laughs> now, remember, when you get your certificate and your baptismal thing, hang on to them. They're special. My wife's telling me to knock it off. No, just blessings. Ready, Randy. Oh, I can do it. You told that. Let's see, Randy. Your name, brother. Randy Eugene Garrison. Randy Eugene Garrison, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Every day. Amen. Amen. Are you going to serve him all the days of your life? Would you like your wife to help with the baptismal? If she wants to. Take off the step, Master. Lord, we just thank you. Stretch out your hands with me. Lord, I thank you for Randy. I thank you, Lord, that this is a special day, a renewed day. Lord, this is a day of anointing. This is a day of refreshing. This is a day of recognition. This is a day of... That you, Lord God, are going to do something fresh in Randy. Lord, that his mind is going to become refreshed. The peeled back from the junk of the world. He's going to be able to retain better. He's going to be able to read better. He's going to be more sensitive to your Holy Spirit. He's going to be more quickening to your voice. Lord, I thank you that as he takes this step of obedience, Lord, your reward is ready and waiting for him. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to cross them up there. There you hold your nose. Randy Eugene Goebbels, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for willingness. We thank you, Lord, for leadership. We thank you, Lord God, that we all need brief times of refreshing. And Lord, let this be remembered as a time of refreshing, a time of rededication for both these people, a time of renewing and refreshing, reestablishing in Jesus' name. And everybody who agreed said, Amen. Okay. Amen. All rise, please. I think we're going to go with the last song. Okay, let's go ahead and finish it up. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul.
thank you for all the great moments this morning. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you, Lord, for the rejuvenation, the rededication. Lord, we thank you for the obedience that's being carried out. We thank you, Lord, that we are going to be mindful of your presence and be thankful. Lord, Holy Spirit, keep us aware. Help us to discipline ourselves to be aware of a theology of blessing, your presence, power, peace, provision in our lives every moment of every day. And everybody who agreed said, amen. 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 Coffee and rolls. Prayer team, prayer team in the back over there, unless you want to get rebaptized.